right now on Higher Journeys Radio with Alexis Brooks. Just when you think you've heard it all, when it comes to the perplexing reality of alien abduction and our interaction with non-human species, along comes yet another account that is sure to stand you on your ear. Mary Rodwell, a true researcher and explorer into the ET and human hybrid reality, continues to find some of the most intriguing stories on the planet and off. This time she shares with us her communication with a family in Brazil, all of whom have had multiple interactions with non-human intelligence. But is this family dynamic an isolated incident or more common than we may think? Let's hear what Mary had to say. It is always a pleasure to have on Higher Journeys my friend, my colleague, and someone who always manages to put a smile on my face, and that's Mary Rodwell. You know, I have a little secret for you all out there who know Mary uh, as a serious, no-nonsense, in-depth researcher, which she certainly is. But I have to tell you, she's also really funny. (laughs) I mean, this woman has a wit and humor like I've never seen. And, you know, being in a field that is so important and so paradigm-changing Often we can uh, get into a, a, a challenging and perplexing space. It's it's challenging to the psyche and to our own reality, to say the least. And I'd say most of us that do this work also need some laughter in our li- lives every now and then. And Mary, you've got that covered too. Just a little factoid for the journeyers out there who didn't know Mary is a comedian. <laughs> so there's a little secret for you. Shh, don't tell anybody. By the way, welcome back, Mary. Glad you're on board with us again today. I'm, and I'm tempted to say, can you tell us a joke? But I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me again. And yes, I do have a very healthy <laughs> sense of humor. Um, it's a very English sense of humor. It is. But indeed. I find it the, the only thing that makes sense sometimes on this planet. I agree. Well, I'll say this. Here's how I discovered Journeyers, everybody out there, how she was so funny. You know, I'm trying to think when you were here, Mary, in the States, really here in in Massachusetts, you came to visit me. You stayed with us for, I think, a couple of days, a couple of years, maybe even three years ago. And we were having dinner the the evening you came in. I can't remember, but you just started with the most, as you say, the British humor, but you had me literally falling off my chair. I mean, I and I said to myself, I didn't know Mary Rodwell was so, just so witty. Just, just so I had to share that. And it's just been such a light in my life every time I'm around you and and uh, being being amid that that laughter and that that uh, happiness. So thank you again. So there's your side note. Okay, now let's dive right into what we're going to be discussing here on the show today. And I must segue by saying that what we're going to be talking about, what we're going to be sharing with you all out there is no laughing matter, actually. Once again, we will be talking about individuals who have been affected by their realization of massive connection with non-human intelligence. We'll be discussing ET human hybrids right here on planet Earth. And this particular story uh, that you're about to hear has to do with an entire family. It's a Brazilian family whom you got to know, Mary. This involves both parents as well as their six-year-old daughter. But before we get uh, into this, we're going to get into it pretty straight away. Tell us, how did you come to know this family in Brazil? Well, this um, wonderful lady um, told me she was a former air hostess and that she tried to talk about this to ufologists in Brazil, but said that it, 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 uh, they, were, they really did, struggled with it. They, they struggled with the story of it and where it took them. So she said, I was the first person that she felt might listen to this kind of story, obviously had seen a little bit of what I put out. So what I'm discovering is, you know, when you start doing, and this is why I do interviews with, you you, you know, yourself, Alexis and others, is because you never know where it's going to go or who it might resonate with Mm -hmm. or who it might help. It's exactly the reason for that. So it was because 
of I suppose what she'd heard about my research and you know and and the fact that I'm I'm more or less open to anything you know (laughs) it's like because you have to be because you don't know what you don't know and so I never ever dismiss someone's story no matter how unusual or strange it may be because the fact is I think life is extremely unusual and strange anyway so it's just Mm -hmm. so this is why she contacted me okay now I know that you have spent some time uh, in Brazil. Uh, in fact, I think you did a trip not too long ago. So you did. Have, have you met this this individual at this point? I did this year because oh. I went over there. Um, my my book, you know, the new human is now in in Portuguese. Yes. And I I met her the second time I went there, um, and which was really lovely. Um, in fact, you know, we we're going to. She's go, going to show me and connect me to her family next time I go over there Mm -hmm. but what was interesting about her story all along was the detail that she had in terms of it but it started out if if you want a bit of an overview now yes it started where she told me that she'd had interactions through her life and there was she remembers as a child this tall being in the room Um, almost a feline looking being who she felt was very motherly and very loving. And so for her, that was the start of remembering that. But what was so significant for her because it was very physical was when she was still working as a flight attendant, she happened to be in a hotel and she was going down to breakfast. And as she went into the passageway, she saw a little girl there. She said she looked about 10 or 11. And she was concerned because the little girl was on her own. And she said, I didn't realize at the time that she was that I was talking to her telepathically. But she said to the little girl, where's your parents? You know, um, are you lost? And she said, and when the little girl turned and looked at her, she saw what looked like a monster, which Hmm. afterwards she said, part human, part cat like being. And she was terrified. She ran away from this little girl and she, you know, she she just didn't know what to do with it. She tried to put it out of her mind. And it was only some years later when she recalls an experience on board a spacecraft that she actually saw this little girl again, a, a few years older, but she wasn't the only one. She saw others like her in on the spacecraft and they, they were very much like the feline being that she remembers as being a mother figure. But she then was told that this little hybrid was her daughter. And that was really quite um, startling and scary well, of course. to start with. Yeah, yeah. But she then had a memory of being in a place where she said was very clinical, where she felt um, she also had something implanted in her. And that she connected to this little girl but what is the follow-up of that is only recently she went up on board craft and she saw her human daughter um, her six-year-old human daughter playing with her hybrid daughter on board craft and this was you know quite this this really brought this to a whole new level that she's actually um, seeing her human daughter um, but what was then, and then this is very recent now in, in terms of her experiences, she then discovered that um, she it, it was in her head, your daughter's a hybrid, your daughter's a hybrid, but she's talking about the six, six-year-old human daughter, your daughter's a hybrid. And she didn't know what to make of it until two days later, her husband woke up in the middle of the night and actually said to her, you realize our daughter is a hybrid. And she said, how do you know that? And he said to her, I saw her out of body and she has a mantis form. My goodness, my goodness. So you can imagine that this is completely exploded in terms of a whole new level of understanding. Absolutely. I mean, we're talking about um, independent corroboration for one, because she had received this information in some form or fashion. You had sent me a note, obviously, so I had some bullet points on what had gone down here. I did, I did not realize that there was yet this this other um, individual 
that was that she saw at the hotel, uh, I believe, in addition to the daughter. Now, so here's my next question. You've answered already so many questions that I had had for you. But what about the father, Mary, in terms of his own experiences? And one of the questions I had had for you already answered is, did the mother have some prior experiences? Clearly, that's the case. What about the father? independent of the message that he received about seeing his six-year-old daughter in in the out-of-body state. Have you discovered whether he has some history of encounters? Well, absolutely. Um, What was also part of this incredible account was um, when she told me that only recently, when um, when her husband got really upset, she saw what looked like um, a reptilian. And she said her husband sort of shifted and, and looked like he changed. And it was only when he got angry. She said, he's actually a really loving, loving husband. But she said when he got really angry, he would look, he suddenly shifted and looked like that. And she actually said to him, when you get really angry sometimes, this is what I'm seeing. And he said, well, actually, I know because I've seen it in myself when I've looked in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Um, there's no doubt for him also that he's having experiences because she told me recently they both one night woke up and saw this being in the bedroom. They both saw it together and there were strange effects in the room, Doors, mo- the door looked like it was moving, lights were blinking. And the being they both saw was um, about, looked about 35 with silver hair, strange eyes, um, and he actually had the, this blue and purple rays coming out of his hand, but they both saw this being at the same time. So this was a joint experience. Mm -hmm. Is this unique for you in your research up to this point, Mary, in terms of uh, joint experiences? I mean, you've got the the independent uh, um, information that's come in about the six-year-old child, then the experience that you just talked about, uh, where they had the uh, joint experience. How common is this? I say common, but how rare is it, I guess, is maybe the best way to phrase the question of of two people, two or more people experiencing the same thing. Because look, I have heard so many stories, particularly in a bedroom, let's say, where there is a visitor and invariably, not in all cases, but in many, one of the partners that's in bed will not be, won't even be able to be woken up, let alone see anything. So it seems like it's for one person to see and not the other. So how common is this that both are having these things at the same time? I'm not sure how common it is, but I do know there are other instances where both um, of, the, of the couple are having experiences, although one may be less open than the other one. Mm. What's interesting here is the openness of the part, of the husband to this as well but of course it's not the only ones in the family what we're we're discovering is the one of the daughters is seeing a being as well and she describes this being as being a pixie like being that she sees that teaches her things she's got something in the for the forehead that she's drawn the being i've actually got a picture of the being that i'm going to be showing at the the conference at the cosmic consciousness conference in uluru yes Mm. So I, um, I've got a picture of the being because I asked if she, the daughter who's had experiences herself um, whether she would draw the being because I find it very powerful for people to actually see the kinds of beings and if they've drawn them themselves as an integrity to that, um, that you can, you can actually get a real sense of what's going on. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is um, also that they've got a son and the sun has this connection to lion beings. <laughs> so in a sense, we've got um, the husband with a reptilian kind of connection. We've got the cat feline being with the mother. We've got this pixie-like being with the 18-year-old daughter. We've got the lion being with the sun. So we've got, um, in, a, in a way, a real collection of different intelligences mm-hmm. interacting with this family, um, with them all having a unique take on their particular experiences. Sure, sure. Well, listen, it looks like the the obvious elephant in the room here, uh, at least as a start, is this 
family dynamic, this intergener well not intergenerational and family dynamic in these realities, this interaction with non human intelligence. This factor of the, the, the entire family or even multiple generations having these connections. It's been coming up more recently, by the way, with the work of other researchers uh, as well that I'm looking at. In fact, I'm re reminded of a new documentary, not yet released, I think it's coming out later this month, called Witness of Another World. And it's by the filmmaker Alan Stiebelman, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And this has to do with an Argentinian man named Juan Perez, who has recalled a uh, a multitude of childhood abduction experiences and was traumatized by them. This is what the, the documentary is based on. But it was also revealed by Stiebelman in a recent interview that he did with Richard Dolan, mutual colleague, that Juan Perez's mother revealed that she too was, I believe, a lifelong experiencer. So here we go again. Mary, what more are you learning about the apparent commonality of this, this intergenerational contact? This aspect seems to be coming up over and over, and definitely more recently. I have absolutely no doubts that um, these intelligences are working with genetic lines. And so it is mm. a very common pattern that even if the person coming to me isn't aware of it, I will say to them, you know, was either of your parents or your grandparents a little, you know, have ever had unusual experiences or ever had a particular focus? And, you know, often they'll laugh and say, oh, granddad was always into UFOs or, um, you know, grandma was always a bit fey or a bit psychic. They always thought she was a little bit crazy or whatever. There's your link. Right away, there's your link. What it's showing is the grandmother was multidimensionally aware or she was, you know, intuitive, which actually shows that um, on some level she was being, um, she was having some kind of uh, interaction or whatever. I always know when they've got some member of the family that has this kind of experience or is, you know, a bit clairvoyant or a bit intuitive, that that's where it may be. And it may be both parents or it can be one particular family line. Right. I was I just going to ask that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I do believe it's orchestrated often for people to connect for a child. What interesting thing is, and a factor that I think is happening a lot, is um, a woman will say, you know, I've got this really amazing child, um, but my husband didn't stay with me very long. Um, he, you know, we got together for a little while, had this child, and then he went on, and um, I'm, you know, bringing up the child on my own. What I, all, um, I'm i seeing with that is often they'll bring um, a genetic partner in, to have a particular genetic mix and then they'll go their separate ways and this is an interesting one because I've come across that a lot um, and it's almost like they've come in to provide the genetic mix and that's all they're needed for and they go off and continue on having a different kind of life and the mother then will be bringing up the child this is very common very common um, and I'm yeah a lot more common than I realized. It was just I was coming across a lot of single parents saying, oh, yeah, we got on really splendidly for a couple of years, but now he's, he's left my life and I'm bringing up this little one on my own. So it's almost like they needed that genetic mix, right? We've got that genetic mix. The father doesn't need to be part of that anymore. Um, he's going off to do something else or whatever. What that is really saying to me is, you know, them being very clear of the kind of genetics they're looking for in a particular child, but not necessarily for the upbringing, which may be left with the mother or whatever. You know, listen, this brings up so many questions, Mary, in terms of orchestration and to what extent third parties may be orchestrating our lives, which leads me to the question of free will. You know, this, this is opening up Pandora's box. I've got to tell you, this is going in a direction I hadn't planned. I, I want to come back to the Brazilian family specifically. But if, if this is something that's cropping up in your research, more than just a notion, what are we dealing with here? And I, I don't even expect you to answer it, but let's explore that. I mean, we're talking about interference. Well, I don't want to be... I don't want to be hasty and say interference because maybe it's part of our contract and our agreement. But this dynamic puts a whole nother slant on free will, it seems. Does it not? 
Hi, this is Alexis Brooks from Higher Journeys. I am so delighted to once again be a part of Australia's most respected consciousness event, the amazing Cosmic Consciousness Conference in Uluru, Australia. I'd love for you to join me for what promises to be a spectacular experience located in Australia's spiritual heartland, also known as the solar plexus chakra of the planet. I've experienced that amazing energy firsthand, and I know that this is a place of high vibration. And this is where the Cosmic Consciousness Conference all takes place, set at the beautiful Ayers Rock Resort, featuring world-class speakers from around the globe, including Tracy Ash, Mary Rodwell, Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright, Barry Eaton, Christine Day, and Martin Kenny, among other fascinating presenters. But that's not all. The activities kicking off the Cosmic Consciousness Conference at Uluru feature an exclusive tour from Ayers Rock Resort to Curtin Springs, a visit to the sacred site of Cave Hill, a reception featuring the rarely seen Aboriginal Anangus Inma Welcome Dance, and then the conference commences. In January of 2020, we will experience a major reset of the planet, and Uluru will be the place to be during this rare and unprecedented event. So, will you join me? Now's the time to make that long-awaited trip to Australia a reality. Visit CosmicConsciousness.com.au to learn more and make your arrangements now to be a part of Earth history at Uluru. I look forward to seeing you at Cosmic Consciousness 2020. Um, on one level, that's exactly what it appears to be, but there's another level to this. Okay. And, you know, the, the way that I work and the way that I've understood, because as you know, I do hypnosis and I work with people who um, will explore past lives. One of the interesting things that comes through when they move from one life into another one, like this present one, they will tell me about how they have chosen their life path. In other words, mm. their parents, their siblings, the challenges that they will have on this planet uh, in this particular life path. So if it's orchestrated, it's orchestrated, I believe, by the soul. The soul itself is saying, right, I need to grow in certain areas. I've got a mission to do, etc. How can I create the right environment for my learning, for my growth, for my mission? So in that sense, it's the soul orchestrating the contract to do this. Mm -hmm. The difference free will as I've come to understand it and everyone will have their own way of understanding free will my understanding of free will is that when you experience something challenging or, or, or whatever you have a choice to see it in one of two ways either as a silver lining or as a victim mm -hmm. so your choice is your attitude to it sure. that is where this is. that's how I've come to understand I don't know if I'm correct but for me that sort of works for me. Working with the fact that I've met many people when I've taken them through a past life and we've got to the point of their death, um, they will experience that death where they see themselves dying of a heart attack or starvation or whatever it is in that lifetime. When they come through the death sequence, I will say to them, so what have you learned in that lifetime? And they may say, well, I learned about limits. I learned about um, compassion or I learned about X, Y, and Z, they are very aware of what they've gained as a soul through that life experience. Mm -hmm. And they, this is how I've come to this conclusion, is that we literally are orchestrating it. And when you've got, as I have many times, I've talked to children, and when they talk about their past lives, and one recently, a 10-year-old was saying to me, I was a will of the wisp by spirit, and I decided to have a lifetime on this planet. I looked at the, the life that I wanted and I chose, and then I found myself in mummy's tummy. Now, you can take that or leave that, but that is another way I'm seeing them understanding and that, you know, what they've experienced with the beings, etc. And Tracy Taylor, as you know, is in both my books. Mm -hmm. And she, um, you know, she mentioned her interaction with the Greys and said, I didn't realize initially because of the fear. But afterwards, I realized I had a contract with them. The contract was that I would allow them some genetic material, and for that, they would assist me with my psychic gifts. Mm -hmm. So her understanding was there was a contract with these beings. So, you know, this is how I'm getting a bigger picture, which takes you out of one level of uh, human understanding into the spiritual understanding of the bigger picture of how many souls are coming to this planet with a mandate. They're coming from uh, other dimensions. 
other as well as these other galaxies and universes and they're coming with certain skills and going through a certain experience to assist to um, if you like so that they can carry out their mission both as as a soul but also the mission that is helping this planet evolve so my perspective has been from that level of understanding sure. although I you know for somebody else that may not work and I don't expect it necessarily to work for everyone right right thank you for that very well said well let's go back to this Brazilian family now I, I want to try to keep track of how many I was under the assumption that there was just the one child but you're saying that there's a teenage daughter a son or, so is it three kids in total Th well three? they've got four children they have four children yeah. okay I missed one <laughs> And what yeah. you're saying is yeah. that each and every member of this family has a connection and or is a hybrid themselves. Was, was there anyone else identified as a hybrid beside the six-year-old child? And forgive me, folks, I'm losing my voice. It's, we're recording this at the end of the day, so I'm a little hoarse. I'm, I may have to clear my throat. I'm sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Anybody else in this family that identified or discovered that they may too be yeah. of mixed DNA? The only one that they both parents were told and identified was the six-year-old daughter. And then it was only because father saw his daughter out of body and she she had a mantid form, but he knew it was his, her daughter. But he knew it was um, her his daughter. daughter. Okay. But what was interesting with the eldest daughter, the being that she's seeing, she said, you know, and she described her saying her hair was white. There was a blue stone in the forehead. She had a pixie. Um, she had a star constellation she called home. And she said the land was full of snow and ice. So she's connecting to another type of intelligence. So whether or not that makes her a hybrid, what I, I sense is that we can, even though we're in the same family, we can have different genetic mixes or different connections to these intelligences. This is what this is highlighting mm -hmm. more than anything. Even if you've got parents um, with the same, it may be that some um, have an added part to their genetics and the reason I'm saying that is that I talk about a young lady called Marina who um, she actually uh, explains a little bit about the hybrids and the kinds of hybrids there are and she says that there are you know some of the levels of DNA in the star seed it's a DNA from parents and metaphysical soul genetics blended together and she said and the star seed is that uh, an awakened one but she said for her, it was her mother when she was pregnant. They genetically altered me with their DNA. Um, and this is the difference um, so that she could connect more to this consciousness. And she talks about her consciousness being connected to Andromeda, Arcturus and Greys. So it seems like with some, they will, uh, if you like, add further genetics if they want a particular program or mm. mix. That's interesting. That at any given time, uh, at any given time in a person's lifespan, you're saying they can come in and alter the DNA to make a, a, re a connection or reconnection. Uh, well, this one was she knows that a mother was taken at, at, at they, basically she was saying that she was um, that they connected. They altered the actual DNA as she got pregnant. And some will oh. say. Some will say that they even knew the precise moment when it happened. Um, they say that there'll be some strange thing that happened just as they conceived, and they will be aware of that. There'll be something quite unusual that will occur, some feeling, I know I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. It's almost like that insight and that the child would be different. There was something about the child that was different. You know, I have a story I'm going to bring up when you say uh, they, they feel that they know that the child is different. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you or the audience for that matter. And I don't know, I don't have a lot of detail about this, but I want to bring this into it. Speaking of different cultures, this has to do, I'm not going to mention any names, but this has to do with someone that I know quite well who has a Middle Eastern background, let's just say. And she recalls somebody in their, uh, um, a family friend, good friends with the mother at the time, this goes back many years, and I'm, I'm going to be a little cryptic, because I don't want to mention any names. But she recalled the a family friend, a mother, a woman, 
who at the time was pregnant. She was sitting with uh, this friend of mine's mother and some of their friends. So there was a family, a little group going on, social group a gathering. And the woman said, as she's pregnant, she's, she says to, to her friends, one of them, including my, my friend's mother, I don't know why I feel like whatever is in my stomach is alien. Now, you can only imagine, uh, you know, this is quite a few years ago. There, I think, was some cultural stigmas, and they began to laugh. They just, they just, they say, oh, you're crazy, blah, blah, blah. So she, she shut up about it. But I think there was something else that had come out, but she says, I don't know why I feel as if what this baby that's in my stomach is alien. I have tried my best, Mary, to get more information out of my friend who was told this by her mother, but th- there's not much more. And only, the only thing I'm bringing, the only reason why I'm bringing this to the table right now is how common, common is a word that's coming up a lot here. How common is this? You know, at some point in this pregnancy, she felt as if I think something had shifted and she was very perplexed by it. And this is just, a, you know, a side note. Somebody, a friend told me this story. How mm, common? I'm not. To be honest, I'm not surprised. And the reason I say that is because of the numbers of emails that I get where somebody would say, my mum was always saying I was an alien um, because I was different or whatever. And and the sense is that they were different. And sometimes the parent gets a real sense of the difference and it makes them very uncomfortable. So they have a really hard time with, with their relationship with their parent. And other times they have a completely different connection. So it's almost like energetically or on some level, the parent just knows um, this intuitive knowing that that child is very different. And it may be very confronting to them. So they are, they can have a really hard time because the, the mother doesn't know how to deal with that feeling of that they're very different and it's uncomfortable. Right. Others will have a, a completely different one. But... I've heard this a lot, and and the person, apart from the person themselves saying, I'm just an alien, you know, I don't belong here or whatever, I, I just an innate knowing. Um, and this is, I've heard this many, many, many times, this this feeling, this knowing that, that they don't belong here mm-hmm. and, it, and the rest of it. But there will be some more aware parents, more intuitive parents that have said, you know, you're an alien or I've always felt you were an alien or whatever. It's easy to dismiss that, isn't it, because mm. of the culture and the belief systems and whatever. Absolutely. But you and I know that if you have a feeling like that, that's not normal. You know, normally we don't go around feeling we're an alien as such, but the average human, at least, mm-hmm. doesn't feel that. So if the sense of that, then that's telling you something. You know, it is actually telling you something. And I believe that people should listen to those feelings of sensing and knowing. And I, I think it's a lot more common than people realize. I absolutely agree with you. I, you know, as you know, I spoke about this in Australia last year. Is this perhaps being, we're talking more about uh, general contact, if you can call it general. I don't know if there's anything general about it, but it being far more ubiquitous than we know. Um, but how deep does this go? I'm, you know, I'm reminded of a, <clears throat> excuse me, another documentary that was made uh, about a year or so ago by uh, a friend, a dear friend of mine. Um, uh, oh my God, Jack Roth. Oh my God, <laughs> it's late and I'm forgetting names. Jack Roth, shout out to you, who uh, he and his partner John Semple uh, made the film. Oh, and I'm gonna forget it. I'm really bad. Help me here, Mary. Is it, is it the seeding? I think the it's, seeding, it's the, the seeding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm really, I'm having a, a brain fart. <laughs> That's what they call it today. <laughs> today is brain fart day. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Anyway, this move, this this documentary is brilliant. In fact, I'll put a link to the interview that I did with uh, both Jack and John. The seeding. That's absolutely correct. This was a follow up to their their uh, movie with Stan, the Stan Romanoff story. But a lot of this had also to do with uh, impregnation, uh, with altered DNA. Uh, we both know quite a few of the individuals that were interviewed in that film. Again, the common denominator seems to be it's happening a lot. It's happening a lot. We're going off the beaten path a little bit, but I, I just feel like I want to follow this trajectory a little bit, Mary. Why do you think, and I know this is 
a fairly common question. Why is there such secrecy? Or why why are we left to put the pieces together for ourselves on this? Why aren't we seeing things for what they are? If this is happening, why aren't we, why isn't this more a transparent phenomenon, you think, to all of these individuals? What gives there? That's a hard one. Yeah. Um, and again, I know. I, you know, the, I go back to what is the sole mandate. Um, and I think that if we've incarnated at this time where there's going to be a huge shift in the paradigm, I believe soon, with a truth embargo, we live on a planet where a lot of the truth of who we are, what we are, in terms of our origins and history, is hidden from us. We're lied to on a constant basis. So we've come to a planet, I believe, almost like spiritual warriors, to actually change the system and to change the power structure on this planet to one of transparency and truth, and to be all that we can be. What we've got encoded in our DNA, I believe, will make us, you know, amazingly, um, uh, well, we'd be super beings, literally, because, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have the ability to, d to be amazing, but we're being suppressed all of this is being suppressed. So I think we've come in to go through a process of understanding the status quo so that um, through our own experiences of the, the hidden agendas and whatever, the fact that we are lied to, et cetera, et cetera, it's all part of us understanding what's going on so we can then start to change it so that we can actually bring in the fact that we are um, amazing beings and that we can challenge this system and we can change it. This is why all the new children uh, are coming in that I talk about in The New Human. They've come in with this heightened awareness so that they can change the system. But if they came in too early, then they, they would be even more suppressed. It's got to be about timing. So for some of us, our soul journey is to, be, to, to go through a process of gradual unfolding for some of us, it's a, a, um, a far speedier, um, depending on, on what our mandate is, what our job is, if you like, mm -hmm. as we've come to this with, our, with that, the mission, if, if you want to put it that way. So for each soul, we've got a soul, um, a, we've got a mandate for our soul to grow spiritually, but we've also got a mandate to help the planet and human consciousness as well. So there's a double mandate there. And so each one has... A, um, if you like that that program that they need to go through so why is it hidden it's hidden to allow us to experience i think this is what as a soul why we come in without the memories mm -hmm. of who we are so that we can experience fully without that awareness it enables us to really experience what being human is what right. it is to be blocked and and shut down sure what it's like to experience pain and trauma, but also how we can grow through those experiences sure. as well. But if we saw the knowledge, we'd say, oh, well, this is just a created reality, um, <laughs> and I'm not going to take it seriously. So, on, you know, the only way we're going to take it seriously is to experience it. So, for me, that's how I've, uh, you know, this is what makes sense to me. I'm, I'm not expecting everyone to, to follow that or, or to even believe that that's relevant to them. I don't know. But if it resonates... And it does to me, it helps me make sense of what we're all experiencing, the limits that we believe we're experiencing when we told, we're told actually there is no limits. So we're going through a process of discovery. I was just going to just gonna say, yes, absolutely. I, not to cut you off, but the discovery was the word that just kept, you know, coming, coming to me, self-discovery. And perhaps we need the block in order to really rediscover, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And I think what we're doing is rediscovering exactly who we are. And I'll bring in this for some people because um, I mentioned the genetics many times because that's the clue, I think, to, you know, the dormant DNA that's being activated. And I, I've mentioned, you know, uh, the film um, that where uh, this young lady, I've, I've, now I've got a block, a mind block <laughs> of, of the film. Um, that actually where she's um, activated through through drugs. Lucy, the film Lucy. Oh, yes. And, we But we've talked she, about that before. We love that. Yeah. I love that film. Yes. Well, it's telling us, um, I believe, um, in, in, in a symbolic way that as we get activated, that is the potential mm -hmm. for humanity. 
that is where we're going, or I believe we are. That's that's the that's the future of humanity, and and that's what I think these intelligences that are coming, that are assisting this planet, that are helping us wake up. Um, sometimes to wake up, you only wake up when you are really fed up. You're you know you're scared. Or you're fearful. The only time you actually move spiritually is when your back is against the wall. Yes. So, so for some people, their back has to be against the wall before they get it. I get and it. And others, maybe, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's sometimes because we're all inclined to be a bit lazy. Yeah, I'll do that sometime. Maybe <laughs> next year or whatever. And then we, we get a diagnosis of cancer, or we get a diagnosis, or you know, our family falls apart, or whatever. And all of a sudden, oh my God, I've got to really do something now because. Um, and so this is why we experience such things, because it is a catalyst, if we choose to see it like that, for change within ourselves. Beautiful. I tend to resonate with that, for sure. But it's it's good to hear. And, you know, I, I brought up the question, Mary, simply because, you know, we know that there's been so much that's been kept from us going back to, you know, why we're having these experiences and not and not being fully aware and conscious of them. We know that there's been a lack of transparency in terms of our human, you know, some of these human factions. Apparently, there's th this going on, this this secrecy, this these hidden uh, variables with non-human intelligence. But the lesson behind where, why that uh, that um, hidden those hidden things may be existing is uh, very powerful. It's something to learn. I'm, I'm going to repeat again. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it again. Tom Campbell's Entropy Reduction Trainer for Souls. It's tough stuff here, guys, but there's something to be gained and gleaned from learning um, and making changes based on what we've learned. Trainers for maybe becoming Lucy one day. Hmm. I think I'm going to watch that again, by the way. I love that movie. I love it so much. Wow. Listen, we're, I can't believe it. We're winding, winding down. We only got about five minutes, five or six minutes left. Uh, there are a couple of things I'm not going to be able to get to, but I, I want to just touch back on this Brazilian family. You're going to be speaking. Um, I'm so delighted to say that both of us are going to be speaking, sharing the stage coming up next January in Uluru. I'll be back there once again in Australia for the Cosmic Consciousness Conference. And you're going to be going into more depth about this Brazilian family. You, you brought it up very briefly. You're going to have some visuals. Uh, for those looking to attend or maybe thinking about attending this great conference in Uluru, tell us a little bit more about uh, what they can expect from your talk there, including the Brazilian family. Well, I've got a lot of new information from the children and how they're coming to assist this planet. I'm also going to help, you know, uh, or at least share a little bit for the parents that are wanting to understand a little bit more about how they can help their children Excellent. with that as well. That's um, important. You know, it's, it's a, that's really important in terms of because of, of where we need to go with these children, how we can support them to, to do what they've come here to do. So it will be a, a mix of both of those main main focus. Okay, great. I know everyone's going to want to hear more about the Brazilian family. I mean, you have so many stories, so many things. And it's, again, connecting dots. And I know that you, you're brilliant in doing that, Mary, in all of the cases that you've taken and all the different dimensions. You are so keen at seeing the common threads that are running throughout. And I'm just grateful that you and I have been able to to meet out some of those common threads in, in the course of our conversation. So I thank you for that. Anything else you want to share about the Brazilian family before we leave it and leave the show for today? Any other little point that, uh, so let me ask you this, is there any, have you written anything down where people can go? Are, are there any uh, articles that you've written about this particular case or this, is this still sort of emerging and developing? It's still emerging <clears throat> and developing. What's interesting is since I've spoken with her and she's mentioned another lady in a, because they're very much into spiritism in, in Brazil. Ah. And this late spiritual perspective came up to her and said, you've had in encounters haven't you and this took her by surprise and she was so grateful because it started to help her feel more normal because since then she's now seen um or had experiences where she's connected with other intelligences and been told more about her own mandate which i will talk about more in uh, cosmic consciousness is her mandate and the beings that have told her what her job is um in terms of her origin as well so i'll be able to explain that a little bit more Excellent. Oh, I know it's going to be great. Are you giving just one talk there, Mary, or more than one? I think we may be doing something else together. I'm not sure. Can't talk about that yet, but 
Are you doing, is that your main lecture or are you doing a couple of things? I think that's the, the only one, but I need to check on that one as well. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> oh, it's a great conference. I'm going to give it a, a, a nice big plug here, folks. Listen, I'm in Massachusetts. Mary, Mary's in, a little closer. <laughs> She's in Queensland, Australia. Uh, but I'm going to be traveling across the globe to go there. I don't know where you all are. I know you're all over the world, actually. But I've got to tell you, if you're in the States, perhaps the UK, or maybe in Australia, I think it's worth the trip. I think you should check it out. I want you to go to cosmicconsciousness.com.au. You will see all of the details there. I believe you can register there. I'm not sure, but I know you're going to get everything you need there and you can decide from there. I uh, want to just mention some of the other speakers that will be coming along with myself and uh, Mary Rodwell. We have Christine Day and Dr. Louis Turi. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, who I love, Tracy Ash, who uh, Tracy and I were both there last year, as well as Martin Kenny from the UK. And, and there are more, there are many more, but it's, it's a great lineup. And listen, I've got to give a shout out to the conference organizers. I just love Catherine. Hey, Catherine, Catherine Hand and Mick Turner, who always put on a spectacular event with Cosmic Consciousness. So I hope you all will check it out again, cosmicconsciousness.com.au. Mary's going to have, um, and, and by the way, Mary, you know, I love your lectures. I've seen so many at this point, and they're all always new information, great visuals, a dot connecting exercise, and I know it's going to be chock full of uh, great information. And I can't wait to find out what else is revealed once you get there, not only with the Brazilian family, but some of the other uh, families, children that you're working with. So I'm sure there'll be a lot more. So any last words, any parting words before we end this discussion today from you, Mary? Um, all I can say is that we live in amazing times and whenever it starts to look a bit dark out there in, in terms of the, the global um, uh, events, just remember that we've come here to be part of the shift and the change and that everything will change and it will be something that we've, we've, desi we've desired to be here for as a soul. And quite honestly, you've come at a really exciting and special time. So keep on with the hope because I believe that everything will change and we're part of it. I love it. I know that's what drives you. Every, you know, we've had some, some deep conversations. They're all deep and some of them have had some dark elements, but at the end of the day, the silver lining is what wins out and you hold on tight to that silver lining and it's a, it's a thick lining, it's a big one. So thank you for that, Mary. We can't hear that enough. Mary Rodwell, you know, you know what I call you, my mum. <laughs> I just love you. Always a pleasure to have you. And always a pleasure to have all of you out there, journeyers. Thank you so much for listening. And again, head over to, to cosmicconsciousness.com.au if you're interested in attending this conference, as well as Mary's website. Hey, let's tell you've changed your website, by the way, right? It's no, no longer a, a cern.com.au. Right. Tell us the website so people can go to see you too. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's it is a CERN as well. Ah, okay. But also, there's the AlienLady.com.au as well. But MaryRoddle. All of them. You'll find me through any of the websites. Very good. We'll make sure to have uh, at least one of them linked, maybe all of them, so we can check out or you can check out Mary's great work. Once again, Mary, thank you again for for uh, gracing us with your presence. Always a pleasure. And we thank you, journeyers, for joining us once again for this episode of Higher Journeys. We'll talk to you real soon. Take care.